Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Mark. I'm from Colorado. I grew up in Detroit. After I got married, I moved to Colorado, where my wife is from. I've been in Guangzhou for about a year. I live in Ilgotong. I teach at Ilshin Hakyo, Ilshin Middle School. So it's a treat for me to be here and share about Mike Royko. His influence, his writing style has had the greatest influence on my own writing. So he's taught me a lot. I, disco I discovered his writing in college. When I was taking a break, I found a book and I started reading it 10 years ago. And I've been reading all of his books ever since. And when I was accepted to do this speech, I contacted his son. Uh, Mr. Royko has since passed away. He's deceased. But I contacted his son, and his son helped me as well with this. So allow me to show you who we're speaking about. This is Mike Royko. Also Mike Royko. Always with a cigarette, always with a cup of coffee, always with a newspaper, always with a grin, always with mischief in his eye. Mr. Reichel. Mr. Chicago. What I'm going to do this afternoon, instead of just telling you about Royko's work, I'm going to read three columns. Before I read the column, I'm going to tell you why it's important. News is about people. And Mr. Reichel started writing in the 60s. In the United States during the 60s, there was a culture war. Blacks and whites were fighting, men and women were fighting, youth and old people were fighting. There was almost a civil war. <laughs> and Mr. Royko, uh, he told the story in his column, and he was honest. Royko hates corruption. He hates corrupt politicians. He hates bureaucracy. He hates poverty. He's in the wrong city. <laughs> Chicago is corrupt. The cops need to get paid off. The mayor needs to get paid off. It's all bureaucracy. It's nepotism. The mayor is doing favors for his friends. Royko is not only saying this, he's writing this in one of the most widely read newspapers in the state of Illinois and the whole country. His columns were read every day by millions of Americans. Some people hate him. Some people love him. Some people said he was a racist. And he's just telling people what a lot of people were thinking. So I, put, I picked three columns, which was very difficult. Reichel wrote 8,000 columns. This book is put together by his friends and family. They read every single column twice. Put them together, picked out the best, did it again, and did it again till they had this. Over 30 years, three decades. So he captured America in print. He became famous and nationally noteworthy when he wrote a book about the governor, of, the mayor of Chicago, Mayor Daley. If you're from the United States and you say Chicago, it's fair to say Chicago dirty politics, Chicago corruption, Chicago, I'm in danger. This is dangerous. Black neighborhood, white neighborhood, uh, Polish neighborhood. Not everybody gets along. And here's a guy with a big mouth and a high degree of writing. He loves to write and tell stories. I have three columns, I'll introduce them, I'll tell you why they're important. Think about where you were when he wrote this. If you were alive during the 60s, you understand what he's saying. 70s, 80s, and 90s. He died in 1997, he wrote a column every day for his paper. Uh, do keep in mind, the reason he's doing this is because he hates corruption. The first column I picked 
is from December 19th, 1960. Uh, let me skip that. I'm going to do that one later. That's his best one. <laughs> April 9th, 1968. Several years after Lyndon Baines Johnson, the American president, passed the Civil Rights Act. The civil rights was such a hot issue. People were being murdered in the South. People are being lynched. Blacks are being lynched. They're not allowed to vote. People won't let them vote. They can't go to a white school. They can't ride a certain bus. They can't go to a certain restaurant. Finally, the president finally makes a good decision, signs the Civil Rights Act. 38 major cities across the United States have violent riots. This does not go over well. In a democracy, this didn't work. Uh, the violence was so bad, Lyndon Baines Johnson did not run for president again. It was too dangerous. Keep in mind, Kennedy was just assassinated. When Kennedy became president, people were upset because he was Catholic. You can't have a Catholic president. Sure you can. It caused a lot of contention. Here's the article. FBI agents are looking for the man who pulled the trigger, and surely they will find him. But it doesn't matter if they do or they don't. They can't catch everybody. And Martin Luther King Jr. was executed by a firing squad that numbered in the millions. They took part from all over the country pouring words of hate into the ear of the assassin. The man with the gun did what he was told. Millions of bigots, subtle and obvious, put it in his hand and assured him he was doing the right thing. It would be easy to point out that the southern redneck and say he did it, but what of the northern disc jockey turned commentator with his slippery words of hate every morning? What about the northern mayor who steps all over poverty program advancement thinking only of political expediency until riots fester? Whites react with more hate and the gap between races grows bigger. Toss in the congressman with the stupid arguments against busing and the pathetic woman who turned out with eggs in their hands to throw them at children. Let us not forget the law and order type politicians who are in favor of arresting all the Negro prostitutes in the vice districts. When you ask them to vote for laws that would eliminate some of the causes of prostitution, they babble like the boobs they are. Throw in a Steve Tello or two, the Eastern and Southern European immigrant, or his kid who seemed to be convinced that in 40 or 50 years, they built this country. There was nothing here until they arrived. You see, that gives him the right to pitch rocks when Martin Luther King walks down the street. They all took their place in King's firing squad. And behind them are the subtle ones, those who never say anything bad. They just nod when the bigot throws out his strong opinions. So when the brother-in-law or the car playing buddy from across the alley spews out the, facial, the racial filth, he nods. And give some credit to the most subtle of the subtle, the distinction belongs to the FBI, now looking for King's killer. The agency took part in a mushrooming campaign against him that to this day demands an investigation. The bullet that hit King came from all directions. Every two-bit politician or incompetent editorial writer found in him, not themselves, the cause of the racial problems. It is almost ludicrous the man came on the American scene preaching nonviolence from the first day he sat at the wrong end of a bus. He preached it in the north and was hit with rocks. He talked it to the day he was murdered. Hypocrites all over this country would kneel every Sunday morning and mouth messages to Jesus Christ. Then they would come out and tell each other after reading the papers that somebody should string up King, who was living Christianity like few Americans ever have. This is 1968. In one column, and this is why people love him, in one column, he finds fault with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Church, Christianity, and the nation as a whole, both North and South. Who killed Martin Luther King? We did. You did, you did, you did, you did. The one guy had the gun, but you all killed him. In one article, he takes on everybody. This guy's either really brave or stupid. 
There were 38 riots in the country that year over civil rights, and he's writing this. And people loved it. He gave a voice to the opinion. Everybody's thinking it, everybody feels strongly, and he wrote so smoothly. He makes it sound easy. Very brave. I always admired him for that. The second column I picked, shall I read another? Is that okay? The second one I picked is December 10, 1973. About 10 years after the previous. 1973, the United States is neck deep in the Vietnam War. Uh, uh, had it ups and downs. Uh, lots of people are upset. We still have trouble with civil rights, and women's rights is trying to take off in the early 70s, the feminist movement. And now we have Vietnam soldiers, uh, Vietnam soldiers coming home uh, wounded and not being helped by the veteran administration. Reichel is a veteran. He served in the United States Army here in Korea. He got his start in writing. Uh, he told a little lie to his sergeant. When his mother was sick in Chicago, he wants to transfer home. He can't. He's a radio operator. He has to stay with his unit. But he finds a job uh, in Chicago in, in, a new, in an army newspaper. And he lies and says, well, I used to write. Uh, I used to write for the Chicago Times. And the sergeant signs him off and lets him go home. That's how he got to start writing. He spent that weekend reading books about news, how to write a newspaper. <laughs> nice start. As a veteran, he understands how this man feels. This man gets his face blown off by a rocket. He didn't even see combat yet. He's sitting in his tent. Here's the column. Leroy Bailey had just turned 21. He was one of seven kids from a broken family in Connecticut. He had been in the infantry in Vietnam for only one month. Then the rocket tore through the roof of his tent while he was sleeping and exploded in his face. He was alive when the medics pulled him out, but he was blind, and his face was gone. It's the simplest way to describe it. He no longer had a face. That was the spring of 1968. He went to an army hospital, was discharged, and shipped to Heinz Veteran Administration Hospital west of Chicago. After three years and much surgery, they told him there was little more they could do for him. He still had no face. Now Bailey spends most of his life in the basement of his brother's home in suburban LaGrange. The brother moved here from the east to be near him while he was hospitalized. He knits wool hats, which a friend sells for him. He listens to the radio or a tape player. Because of his terrible wound, most of his goals and pleasures of, his, of men of his age will always be denied him. But there is one thing he would like to be able to do someday. It isn't much, because most of us take it for granted. He would like to eat solid foods. Since 1968, he has eaten nothing but liquids. He uses a large syringe to squirt liquid foods down his throat. Last year, through some friends of his brother, Baby met a doctor who specializes in facial surgery. The doctor said he believed he could reconstruct Baby's face so that he could at least eat solid foods, but it would require a series of at least six separate operations. Bailey agreed, and the first operation was performed at Chicago's Mercy Hospital. The doctor sent the hospital bills to the Veterans Administration. They did this because Bailey and his brother were under the impression that the VA would pay for any treatment he needed that wasn't available in the VA. The VA refused to pay the bills. The official, the official reason was explained in a remarkable letter sent to Bailey by the VA officials. He prints the letter. <laughs> nice. Until he was hit by a rocket, Bailey had teeth. Now he has none. He had eyes. Now he has none. He had a nose. Now he has none. People could look at him. Now most of us turn away. Bailey believes that the VA thinks he wants surgery just to look better. Even if that were so, why the hell not? If we can afford $5 million to make Richard Nixon's San Clemente property prettier, what can we do that is humanly possible for this man's face? But Bailey insists it isn't his appearance that concerns him. He wants it to be normal. 
I picked this column, uh, first of all, because it's obvious. Reichel puts a face on a man who literally has no face. When this column met press and was released to the public, within 24 hours, President Nixon got on the phone, called the VA, and this guy was in the hospital the next day having his surgery. All of a sudden, the VA had money. Within 24 hours, the President of the United States read this column and picks up the phone. That's power. This guy got his surgery because of this column. Reichel takes it personally. This guy lives in Chicago, he's a veteran, and the VA, which is a bureaucracy, and Reichel hates bureaucracy, is denying this man his, his benefit. Write a column. Get the president's ear, the president makes a phone call. The $5 million was spent on Nixon's personal home in California. So the CIA and his bodyguards could have a swimming pool. Do you think he's not a little ashamed now for spending five mil on his own house? Yeah, the guy got his face. That's why I like Royco. He takes it personal. Sorry, I'm just flailing my arms. <laughs> not to worry about it. The last column, uh, it, it was a difficult one. And by the way, uh, this is Reichel on the right, and on the left is his friend, Spets Turco. Uh, Reichel was such a pop icon that there were uh, stage productions of his columns and his life and personalities based on him done on stage. If you want to know where Reichel was on the weekend, he was playing softball or at a Cubs game. He was Mr. Chicago. Everybody loved him for that part. The first annual Rifle Rib Fest uh, in Chicago. People love to eat. You can still go to the Chicago, uh, Taste of Chicago out on Navy Pier. I went before I came here. This is what the column looked like. So this is what Nixon would have read. Oh my God, he found out about my $5 million uh, refurbishment of my California property. I better make a phone call. They look like this. Here's a nice one. Write till you puke. <laughs> Have a drink, do some writing. This is what it looked like when uh, I was reading them. But this last column is kind of personal, especially for Americans who remember this man. Who is this man? Thank you. John it's John Belushi, that's right, with a big smile. Okay. Why do we smile? We he love Belushi. And he was on Saturday Night Live. He <laughs> is Saturday Night Live, that is right. Who did he play? In the W. That's right. He's one of the original cast members. Belushi is Mike Reichel's nephew. Belushi is Chicago. Reichel is Chicago. Belushi and Reichel are both sons of immigrants. Reichel's parents are Ukrainian, and Belushi's parents are from Albania. If you remember uh, Belushi's skit, Cheeseburger, 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 Pepsi No Coke, that's his dad. That's what he saw. It wasn't just a skit. That was real. Reichel is this guy's uncle. So we remember him uh, like this, Samurai Night Fever, uh, the Samurai Valley. We all remember this uh, when we were kids. Belushi's face is everywhere. We all remember his film. When he died, Reichel lost his nephew. Here are these two great Americans uh, from nowhere in Chicago that probably shouldn't be famous but became famous, and people loved them. But Reichel remembers when, this, when he was a kid, five years old, playing around. So when he died, uh, you know, he took that personally. Here's the article he wrote. Like so many Chicagoans, last Thursday night, I was watching a return of the original Saturday Night, Saturday night Live show. I was rewarded when I saw John Belushi come to do one of his outrageous skits. As happened, whenever I saw John perform, I felt a mix of emotions. Amusement, of course. 
All he had to do was lift the brow and curl his lip, and he could make me laugh. I go back a long way with the Belushi family. John's late Uncle Pete was one of my closest friends and godfather to my first child. John's father and I were also friends. I first set eyes on John when he was about five years old, running around his uncle's backyard. I don't remember him being very funny then, but he and the other Belushi kids were always noisy. So when John became successful, I suppose I felt something of a great deal of pride for him. But as I watched him on my TV or movie theater, I always felt puzzled. Where did this incredible comic instinct come from? His parents were good people, but not visibly humorous. Yet they produced two sons, John and Jim, who, gave, who both had the gift of being able to make strangers laugh. I remember when I first learned that John had become an entertainer. It had to be a dozen years ago, and I was in an independent political rally at a big restaurant. A young man came up to me, and in a shy way said, Uncle Mike? I guess I blinked for a moment because he said, You don't remember me, I said. I know you're one of the Belushi kids by your goofy face, but I'm not sure which one. He laughed. I'm John Adamson. I asked him if he was there because he was interested in politics. He said, I just joined the second city. We're going to do some skits tonight. As I said, I was always had a mix of emotions when I watched John, and last Thursday night I felt a twinge of sad nostalgia. That's because he was playing Pete the Greek, the owner of the short order diner. You know the one, cheese burger, cheese burger, cheese burger. Of course, the story of underground Chicago isn't only about infrastructure. One of the city's most famous restaurants is also beneath the streets. Cheeseburger, 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 cheeseburger. No price change and no bad Chico. The Billy Goat was made famous by John Belushi and Dan Amphoy in this iconic Saturday Night Live sketch. <laughs> Some of us remember that. I remember hearing that in school. We all said the joke. Billy Goat Tavern really exists. The cheeseburger thing really happened. These guys are kids of immigrants who come to America, uh, and, and, the Belushi, and John Belushi's parents started with one grill, uh, making hamburgers every day, saying cheeseburger, cheeseburger, fries, Pepsi, no Coke. They really did that. And, and developed their businesses into greater restaurants four or five star restaurants. They have the American dream. They work every day. Uh, and the same for White Oak. But when Belushi died, and this is all set up for this column, you know, everyone took it uh, personally. Belushi was only in his 20s when he died, his late 20s, early 30s when he died. March 16, 1982, don't write off Belushi. The moment it was determined that drugs had caused, caused John Belushi's death, they snatched up their pens and paper to express their self-righteousness. You've been caught with your pants down, was the triumph message from Miss Martha McKinn of Portland, Oregon. I assume Mrs. McKinn means that because I wrote a column expressing sadness at the sudden death of a friend, I should now be embarrassed because of the circumstances surrounding his death. She went on to say, life was certainly not unfair to Belushi. He had fame, money, adulation, and blew it on dope and abroad that was not his wife. He got what he deserved. Sincerely. And I'm sure Mrs. McKinn is sincere. At least I would sincerely hope that people would not be insincere when expressing what amounts to be glee at someone else's death. Miss Pauline Olson was not exactly bubbling with compassion either when she said, Boy, I bet your face is red. You give us a song and dance about that all-American kid uh, your friend Belushi, and now it turns out he was just another show business dope user. Frankly, I never liked him much. He was fat and crude. I'm not surprised he came to such a bad end. Well, I hate to disappoint Mrs. Olson and Mrs. McKinn and all the others, but no, I'm not embarrassed, and no, I'm not going to apologize. When I wrote about Belushi, he had only been dead a few hours, and nobody knew what caused his death. Later, I was surprised to learn that he had been using drugs. When I had seen him in Chicago last fall, he appeared to be leading a clean life. Soft drink, sensible diet, regular exercise, and no evidence of drug use. 
Had I known about this drug use, I wouldn't have been any less sad. If anything, I would have felt worse because of the wastefulness of his death. Nor does the way he died mean that he was, as Mrs. Olson so harshly contends, not a decent person. The fact that he stuck needles in his arms could mean that he was capable of stupidity or that he might have been weak, self-indulgent, or guilty of whatever character flaws make otherwise intelligent people perform self-destructive acts. <coughs> I like this article, first of all, because it encapsulates so much of America. When he wrote this, everybody knew about Royko, everyone knew and loved Belushi. When he died, the death needed a voice. We needed to hear something. We needed somebody to make sense of this. Royko always made sense of things. He made it simple, he put it in one newspaper column. And everyone appreciated that. And he, let, he gave some dignity to Belushi's death. Everyone was saddened and angered when he died. Belushi was known as America's guest. In Chicago, sometimes uh, Belushi would walk around, he'd walk up to someone's house, knock, and come in. He would just come into your house. He doesn't know you, but he'd come into your house, go to the fridge, have a sandwich, and fall asleep on your couch. People loved it. Belushi came to my house. He ate my sandwiches. It was great. And his nickname was America's Guest. We loved that. What a great personality. Both are from Chicago, immigrant kids. They both did something great. And we love that about him. But I love that he gave Belushi some dignity to a tragic family like that. The last column I have is a gift that I'm giving you. This is probably his, his most loved and best remembered column. December 19, 1967. And I have to say as a side note, can you imagine being his editor? You have to take Reichel's column and deliberately put this in a paper where everyone's going to read it and call you when they get angry? This guy did this for 30 years. He made people angry by telling the truth and making these jokes and putting the joke back on people. The mayor, you're going to take on the mayor of Chicago? The guy did that for 30 years. And, um, you know, that's why people love, they love that about him. It's estimated that, that his columns boosted the circulation of his newspaper by 100,000 copies. 100,000 copies every time they printed, just so people could read his column. They'd get angry, but they read it, people loved it. This is his most popular and most loved. And this one is unusual. It took him three years to write this column. Usually he'd write a column in a day. He'd light a cigarette, he'd get his coffee, he'd wander around the news building or the courtroom, listen to what people are talking about, think about it, ruminate, and start writing what's going on in the world today, the world of Chicago. This one's different. He wrote it, rewrote it, he wouldn't let anyone see it until it made print three years later after he started it. I love this one. This one, in fact, was written in pulpits around the country. It was so popular. December 19, 1967. Mary and Joe, Chicago style. Mary and Joe were flat broke when they got off the bus in Chicago. They didn't know anybody, and she was expecting a baby. They went to a cheap hotel, but the clerk jerked his thumb at the door when they couldn't show a day's rank in advance. They walked the streets until they saw a police station. The desk sergeant said they couldn't sleep in a cell, but he told them how to get to the Cook County Department of Public Aid. A man there said he couldn't get regular assistance because he hadn't been an Illinois resident long enough, but he gave them the address of an emergency welfare office on the west side. It was a two-mile walk up Madison Street to 19 South Damon. Everyone gave them a card uh, with a number on it, and they sat down on a bench, staring at the peeling green paint and waited for their number to be called. Two hours later, a caseworker motioned them forward, took out blank forms and asked, any relatives, any means of getting money, any assets. Jo Joseph said he owned a donkey. The caseworker told him not to get smart, but he'd be thrown out. Joe said he was sorry. And in case you don't get the joke, who's Mary and Joe? Mary and Joseph? Yeah. 
The caseworker finished the forms and said they were entitled to emergency CTA bus fare to Cook County because of Mary's condition. And he told Joe to get an Urban Progress Center uh, for Occupational Guidance. Joe thanked him and they took the bus to the hospital. A guard told them to wait on the bench. They waited two hours. Then Mary got pains and they took her away. Someone told Joe to come back tomorrow. He went outside and asked a stranger on the street for directions to the Urban Progress Center. The stranger hit Joe on the head and took his overcoat. Joe was still, still lying there when a paddy wagon came along, so they pinched him for being drunk on the street. Mary had a baby boy during the night. She didn't know it, but three foreign-looking men in strange colorful robes came to the hospital asking about her and the baby. A guard took them to be hippies and called the police. They found odd spices on the men, so the narcotics detail took them downtown for further questioning. The next day, Mary awoke in a crowded ward. She asked for Joe. Instead, a representative for Planned Parenthood came by and gave her a lecture on birth control. Next, a social worker came for her case history. She asked Mary who the father was. Mary answered, and the social worker ran for the nurse. The nurse questioned her, and Mary answered. The nurse stated, stared at the floor and ran for the doctor. The doctor wrote postpartum depression on her chart. An ambulance took Mary to the Cook County Mental Health Center for uh, more counseling. A psychiatrist asked her questions and pursed his lips at the answers. A hearing was held that a magistrate committed and committed her to the Chicago State Mental Health Center on Urban Park Road. Joe got out of county jail a couple of days later and went to the county hospital for Mary. They told him she was at the Chicago State and the baby had been placed in a foster home. When Joe got to Chicago State, a doctor told him that Mary, what Mary said about the baby's birth. Joe and Mary, Joe said Mary was telling the truth. They put Joe in a ward on the other end of the hospital. Meanwhile, the three strangely dressed foreign looking men were released after the narcotics detail could find no laws prohibiting the possession of Murray and Frankincense. They returned to the hospital and were taken for civil rights demonstrators. They were held in the county jail for a hundred thousand bond. By luck, Joe and Mary met on the hospital grounds. They decided to tell the doctors what they wanted to hear. The next day, they were declared sane and were released. When they applied for custody of Mary's baby, however, they were told it was necessary for them to first establish a proper residence, earn a proper income, and create a suitable environment. They applied at the Urban Progress Center for training under the Manpower Developmental Act, uh, and within a week, got a $20 paycheck. Several months later, they finished their training. They saved their money, hired a lawyer, another custody hearing was held, and several days later, the baby was reordered and returned to them. Reunited, finally, they got on their two-room flat, met the landlord on the steps. He told them Urban Renewal had ordered the building torn down. The city relocation bureau would get them another place. They packed, dressed the baby, hurried to the Greyhound bus station. Joe asked the ticket man, uh, when the next bus was leaving. Where to, the man asked. Anywhere, as long as it's right now. He gave Joe three tickets, and in five minutes they were on a bus heading for southern Illinois, otherwise known as Little Egypt. Just as the bus pulled out, uh, three strangely dressed men ran into the station, but it was too late, it was gone. So they started hiking down US 66, but at the last report, they were pinched on suspicion of being foreigners and illegal possession of gold. People love this retelling of the Christmas story because it shows the honest and dark side of Chicago in that day, bureaucracy. And as an immigrant son, Reichel feels, you know, he feels the pain of these immigrants who come here to work and they can't. Poor people can't move forward, blacks can't do anything, the Jewish neighborhoods can't do anything because the mayor is not helping them. The mayor is only doing neighborhoods for his constituents and uh, people who pay him off. That's why Reichel was uh, famous and people loved him. And here's Belushi's grave and his star. But I wanted to do this one because it has so much of American history and Chicago history uh, going back over three or four decades. And uh, Reichel's columns are just as relevant today as they were when he wrote them uh, during our civil rights movement. Thank you.